Praise God. Praise God. Uh, my name is Peter Budiawashira, and I love the Lord as my personal savior. I thank him for giving me uh, this chance uh, to be here and to be the one who is sharing uh, the message uh, today. I have a family. I have one wife. She was here in the first service. And she asked me to pass on the greetings to you, Mumezi Pokea. We are blessed with children. We have two boys, we have two girls, and we are still waiting for more. And, and we are glad parents. We thank God for that. Uh, you know, it takes the hand of God. Eh? Um, as I said, I'm happy to, and delighted to be the one sharing the message uh, today. As we start, uh, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you this morning for the time you have given us to be together and more so uh, for appointing me to be the one delivering your message. As I act as the vessel, my prayer is that um, you are going to help me to channel the message the way you have purposed it, and may, you are, may the recipients, Father, be built, nourished by the word, and may be better, especially in your service. We pray this believing and trusting in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So our topic today is understanding personal finances. And my background is in finance. I've been in the corporate world for many years, but I retired uh, three years ago. So, but I was doing investment advisory, investment management. Uh, so now I am a freelance financial consultant, financial advisor, and I'm happy to be the one sharing the message uh, today, understanding personal finances. There's a lot we can talk about finances. Uh, like I know today we have um, the expo here, which has a lot to do finances. Uh, I, may not, I may not talk a lot about businesses today, we want to focus about personal finance as an individual, as a family. So what is personal finance? Um, as you can see, personal finance is about managing your income according to your financial situation and creating a budget for how to spend and save. You need to have a plan. Uh, we get resources, but do we plan for them? How do we use those resources uh, so that we are able to enjoy the resources God has given us. So personal finance involves evaluating your income, your financial needs, your expenses, and allocating your money accordingly. We want to emphasize needs here because we have many, many, many wants. If we had all the money in the world, there are many things that you'd do. But of course, we can't be able to do everything Therefore, we have to prioritize what is really critical, we need, what we need to achieve, and then whatever cannot be done today can wait for tomorrow. What is the reality on the ground? I'm sure there's somebody who is here who is asking, where has my money gone to? There's somebody else who is saying, the month is longer than the money. Do you feel that sometimes? Which month is particularly longer? Eh? I thought it was for only me that is January is longer. But sometimes you find that um, there are some months you feel that uh, it is too long compared to the, to the resources that you have. There are those who spend more than your income uh, or you are consistently surviving on borrowed money. You could or be on Furiza but you keep on changing your mobile number that you don't pay. Eh? You keep on running away. Uh, you could be here and you are on the CLB list of defaulters. CLB stands for Credit Reference Bureau. It's an organization that uh, tracks people who have not paid loans. Or you are here and you are contented with what you have and you continued working hard and diligently as you wait for God's promises. So those statements may capture a lot of us who are here. Maybe you could turn to your neighbor and ask them, 
Which statement here do you think closely describes you? Because most of us, one of those statements here could be describing somebody who is here. And our prayer is that we would all be at the last bullet there where I said we are all contented with what we have. We continue working hard and diligently. It's our prayer that that's where all of us should be. But unfortunately, we know that has not happened. What does the Bible say about money? And there are many, many verses in the Bible. Uh, we are always reminded that the Bible is our manual. There are many things that we may not know if we do not read the Bible. If we want to learn more about money, then we need to make sure that we read the Bible so that we can be able to get the guidance and the wisdom that is there. Proverbs 10 verse 4 encouraging us, uh, encourages us to work hard with diligence. Um, the Bible encourages individuals to work diligently and responsibly. It teaches that hard work is honorable and that individuals should provide for their families through honest labor. Providing for our families through honest labor. But there are instances that people do not provide through honest. The income you get, the money you get, do you get it honestly or dishonestly? It's very important that we get it honestly so that it can be blessed and can do greater things in what we do. Proverbs chapter 6 warns, again, warns us against laziness. The ant has no commander or overseer, but saves during the time of plenty in preparation for the downtime. Shouldn't we be more organized than the ant? We live in a world of seasons. Even uh, those who are farming, those who are farmers understood, understand the season better. But we know even in business, there is seasonality. There are some good times, there are some bad times. And therefore, we need to prepare ourselves for those uh, bad times. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, reminds us to use and invest the resources. The resources God gives us should be cultivated in order to produce more crops. When we invest what God has given us, we'll provide, he will provide us with even more to give in his service. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 and 33 talks about prioritizing God over money. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we get lost in the in the midst of the many things that happen in our lives, and we focus more on chasing money, chasing money, chasing businesses, chasing wealth, and we forget that it's an opportunity that God has given us to serve whoever we are, and therefore we should be able to acknowledge him in what we do. Another verse, Proverbs 22, verse 7, talks about avoiding debt. The Bible contains warnings about the dangers of excessive and debt and encourages, encourages believers to be cautious about borrowing. It emphasizes the importance of living within one's means. Many of us, we are in debt. And for, all of, for the many years I have been working, and I, I always had a loan. Contentment. The Bible teaches the value of contentment, emphasizing that the true fulfillment does not come from material wealth, but from a relationship with God. Believers are encouraged to be content with what they have. The more money you have does not mean it's the more happier you are. There are some people who are very rich, but they live miserable lives. It is very, it is very good to be content with what God has given you. And of course, tithing is important, and we are reminded in Mark. Marakai chapter 3, about taking the tithe, the house of the Lord. As we talk about uh, personal finance, it's good to look at some principles that will help us to guide us in our journey. And I have listed a few here. When you think about personal finance or family finance, it's good that we always work with a budget that will guide us how we are using the resources. It's good to think about tithing. No, it's is a requirement, is mandatory. Tithing is mandatory. It is good to pay yourself first at the end of the month. When you get money, can you pay yourself first before you pay other people? Avoid unnecessary borrowing. And we are going to talk more about that. Give to others generously. 
the resources you have you need to share with others. And again, then trust in God, not in your finances. So we look at those principles in detail. And if we can put them into practice, they can help us to be better managers of the finances God has given us. Now there is what is called the human life cycle. In your entire life, your entire life can be split into, into three sections. One is the early section um, when you are young, you are growing, you are going to school. Then after school, you come to phase two, where you start earning, you have your own family, you make your own investments, until uh, they are about age 60. For example, if you're in employment, uh, you retire. Like me, I was in um, former employment until age 60, then I retired. So now I'm a retiree. There are many retirees who are here. So when you look at three, these three phases in life, phase one, phase two, phase three, the decisions you make about your finance are different. What you need to do in phase one, or phase two, or phase three are totally different. And therefore it's good to realize where you are so that your financial needs and priorities will be looked at critically for each particular stage. Now, one of the principles we have talked about is preparing a budget. A budget is a clear plan that helps to control the expenses so that you live within your income. It is important that we live within the income that we get on a monthly basis. Living within the income helps us to avoid unnecessary spending. The budget is a tool that will help us to achieve that. And if you do not have a budget, then you are going to spend any howdy, and then you end up overspending. Luke 14, 28 says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? So that talks about budgeting. Before you do anything, it is good to budget. Before you think about the coming month, it's good to think about what are your priorities that, that you need to achieve. Now, I have a sample budget here. From where you are, you may not uh, be able to see the numbers because they are a bit small. But I was assuming for a family budgeting in December, I have assumed that this family has a salary of 100000 I've assumed they have a business income of 50000 I have assumed they are getting interest income from somewhere 5,000. Dividends for those who have invested in shares are 10,000. I've assumed they have sold a plot somewhere and they have made a profit of 50,000. So the total income is 215,000. That is the income they expect to receive in, uh, in the coming month. What are the projected expenses? Because as you receive the income, there are some areas you need to spend this money. I've made an assumption that this family will need 50000 for household expenses, uh, car and traveling expenses, 20000 school fees for term one, 2025, 50000 medical expenses of 15000 gift and donations during this Christmas season of 15000 entertainment, 10000 maybe a Kahori day, Kidogo, 10000 Tithes, and tithes, 21,500, and savings, 21,500. So the total projected expenses is 213,000. So your income is 215, and you are projecting to spend 213,000. So if you are able to stick to that budget, then you are able to live within your means. In fact, according to this budget, you have a surplus of 2,000, which we can call miscellaneous. But again, sometimes you find that majority of people you have an income of 215000 but the expenditure, uh, the things you spend on, you have a total of about 250000 or maybe 300000 and therefore you are in a deficit. So you wonder, where do you get the extra money? And that is where the issues we are talking about borrowing comes, uh, comes in. Now, as you talk about this budget, there are some critical things that you need to spend on first. Of course, when you get your income, it's always good to honor God's commandment of tithing. So you give tithe first, and then you save. Before you spend, set aside the savings. 
Do not spend and save what is left. Do not spend and then you want to pay the tithe after spending because you may find that there is nothing left. It's important for tithes and saving to be given priority. There are some other critical things like the school fees. School fees in term one is very, very critical. Unfortunately, some of you here, you are going to eat the school fees in December. And then when January comes, you start running all over saying there is no school fees. And you had, you had actually budgeted for it and you knew you have, because now the kids are at home, you have received the fees schedule and you already know the amount that you need to spend on school fees. So let's give priority to those things that are priority. Tithing. Tithing, again, um, if I can just recoup, uh, recap on that, is one of the principles. You need to give only 10%. And God is not asking you to give more. If you can give more, the better. But what is mandatory is the 10%. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22 reminds us, be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields produce each year. So a tenth, every month when you get income, just a tenth. The quantity does not matter, or the quantum does not matter. What matters is the honesty. Whether you get a small salary, a medium salary, a big salary, just 10% of what you are getting. Then I have said, always pay yourself first. Paying yourself first is just saving. It is saving and setting aside. Before you spend, at least do at least 10%. Do at least 10%. Because here we are talking about financial freedom. Financial freedom can only come if you set something aside. If you are the person who is overspending, always spending excess of your income, excess of your salary, how then are you going to attain financial freedom? If at the end of the month, every month you have a deficit, every month you have a deficit, you have to borrow to be able to do some things, then you are not likely to attain financial freedom. So if you are looking for financial freedom, can you discipline yourself to saving something small? And the recommendation is 10%. Depending on your circumstances, you may not be able to do 10% as you start. Maybe you can start with 5%. 5% every month, 5% every month. Then when your circumstances improve, then you can do the 10% or the 15%, depending on where you are. We have talked about the ant that saves during times of plenty uh, because of the seasonality. And in the Bible, again, Genesis 41 uh, tells us the story of Joseph when he was in Egypt. There were seven years of plenty and seven years of famine and during the seven years of plenty, Joseph was able to store food because he had been given the mandate by Pharaoh. He was able to store enough food across all the cities. Then during famine, he was able to maintain the nation and even the neighboring nations with that food. So we learn a lot from that story. When you hit a jackpot, whether you're in, sometimes for people who are in business, you, uh, you do a business that gives you a lot of money, but you know the income from the business is seen seasonal. This month, you do very well. The other month, uh, maybe the business doesn't do well. So we should learn to set aside some money. And here we are saying you need some short-term savings, emergency fund saving, and long-term savings. Short-term saving, for example, now we are talking about meeting some obligations in January, because you know school fees is coming, you should have started saving September, no, October, November, and December. Save kidogo kidogo. By January, you have enough. Short-term savings. Emergency saving is some savings you set aside every month, and you make sure you don't use that money. Uh, ordinarily, you'll have, you should have enough money as an individual, as a family, enough money that can take care of your expenses for three to six months without straining because of the savings that you have, emergency savings. You should have enough savings that can take care of your expenses at all times, three to six months. In the past, we have seen people who have lost their jobs. And if you do not have an emergency fund that can cushion you and your family 
you start struggling from day one, it brings a lot of challenges, depression, and it doesn't end well. We saw what happened during COVID. Uh, an emergency came that was unexpected. People lost jobs, business were closed. If you did not have an emergency fund, then it becomes a big challenge. So you are encouraged to make sure that you have an emergency fund, money that you may not use three months, six months from now, but you know that should something happen, you have a fallback position. It gives you time to reorganize yourself um, psychologically and even uh, looking at economically. They give you a cushion. Then you have long-term savings. Long-term savings is when you are saving for the very long term. And one of the things you save for is your retirement. When you are looking through the, the three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three of the human life cycle, the phase in retirement, you need to plan it now. When you are energetic, when you are strong enough, is when you need to set aside some money. Slowly by slowly, you accumulate some money. And this is the money that will take care of you when you are old, when you are not energetic enough. Because if you eat everything, you eat everything, you are, uh, you are surviving on debt. When it comes to the old age, uh, it will be very, very, very tough. And one of the expenses in old age is medical. Uh, our bodies become weaker and weaker as we age, and therefore you need to have a cushion, you need to have resources that can take care of your old self. Because God willing and God blessing you with a lot of days, that time, that time is coming. There are some accounts that you need to have. There are three important accounts that you need to have. You need to have a circle account. You need to have an open uh, money market account. And you need to have an account with the central bank called the Dow account. For you to be able to achieve financial freedom, these are important tools that will help you to save, will help you to put your money together. Even before you think about some big investment, this is the starting point. The beauty of the circle is that when you accumulate some money in the circle and you want to borrow uh, for uh, an important thing you want to do, the rates are very attractive. And then if you have put 50,000, you are able to borrow three times on 50,000. The money market account is good because it helps you to earn interest on, on some money that you are not using immediately or as you accumulate to do something that money earns some interest. If you save in a, in a commercial bank, there are two things. One, they don't pay you interest. Or if they pay you interest, they give you very, very little interest. The money market account is able to give you much better interest. Central Bank of Kenya Dow account is an account that helps you to invest in government securities that offer attractive interest rates. So if you are here and you don't have these accounts, you need all these three accounts. You need all of them. But again, depending on your face in life, you need to make sure that you have one of them. One of the one that I always say you must have, is a must have, is the money market account. The money market is account, in my view, for everybody. You need to have one. And for people who are in retirement or who are nearing retirement, in my view, it is mandatory. The money market is, at, is mandatory um, to open one. I talked about avoiding unnecessary borrowing. Debt is the state of owing money. There is good debt, one that can benefit your long-term financial health. But there is also bad debt, money that is borrowed to purchase items that do not really improve your value in life of your fina financial position. So it is important when you borrow money, is it good, uh, good debt or bad debt? Bad debt is when you buy, for example, you buy, you buy a car. When you buy a vehicle, the value of that vehicle does not increase with time. The value decreases with time. And imagine you have borrowed money to buy that car. So that is a bad debt. Unless you have certified, certified all your other critical requirements so that you can buy a car, maybe it's, again, it depends on your face in life. It could be a priority you have if you have met all your other needs. 
then you can spend on the luxurious item than a vehicle. But if you have not, and we have many young people, they do not own, they do not own a family home, but they, but they drive a very nice car. You are, in a, you are in a rented premises, but you have a bigger car than the one who owns that, that premises where you have rented. Eh? And you are, sometimes you are, using, you are using borrowed money. So that, that is a bad debt. Remember also, if you are a guarantor, it's very careful to know the people you are guaranteeing. Uh, Proverbs 22, verse 26 to 27 uh, talks about be not one of those who give pledges or who put up security for debts. He's also talking about guarantors. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. So when you are a guarantor, you also need to know who are the people you are guaranteeing. What is their integrity? Are they honest people? Or am they are borrowing? So it's good you know the people you are guaranteeing, whether it is a bank loan or a sack loan. There are people you are familiar with. You know where to get them. And therefore, people you can also work together Make sure you are paying. It is important also as a guarantor. Avoiding unnecessary debt. If you look at Proverbs 22, verse 7, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a servant of the lender. If you borrow money, or if you lend somebody, if you lend money to somebody, the person you have lent to becomes subordinate to you. Yani, you can do anything with them. Kwanza wakishidwa kulipa. You can, they are like a slave. You can tell them, do this, do that, do this for me, and they'll do it for you. They are like a servant, they are your servant when you lend money to them. So if you have become burdened with a heavy load of debt, in essence, you have become a slave to the person who have lent to you. Only borrow for purchases that will increase in value or hold value. You buy a house, you buy a plot, you buy some shares uh, that can increase in value. Now, if you look at the borrowing rates in the market, and here we are talking about commercial banks. Commercial banks, for, for example, they charge about 20 to 28%. Microfinances, they charge around 36 to, 6, to 60%. If you are using a credit card, because there is interest, maybe about 21, maybe more than, more than 25 percent, I would imagine. If you are borrowing from a Shylock, you are talking about 120 percent to 180 percent. From a circle, you pay between 12 percent and 18 percent. Uriza is 1 percent per day, I think. So these are indicative rates of what is happening in the market. And each, in each of these segments, there are borrowers. There are people who borrow from commercial banks, there are people who borrow from microfinance. There are people who borrow from Shylocks. There are people who borrow from circles. And you wonder why people borrow from... Why, for example, would somebody borrow from a Shylock this much? So looking at this level of interest rates, as I said, the best one would be the circle. And we always encourage people to be a member of a circle. It is the cheapest. For all the years I have been in a circle, since I started working, I worked and I retired. I remained in the circle. Even today, I'm a member of a circle. The rate in a circle has never changed. Just 12% per year. It has never changed. These other rates will change from time to time. But in, a, in my view, they cannot compete with the rate that comes from the circle. It's good to be in the circle because sometimes you may need to borrow to do something that will help improve your financial our position. I don't know whether you read yesterday's newspaper. I took this clip from uh, yesterday's newspaper. Somebody was saying, help, I am drowning in debts. My gross is 87,000, but I only take home 11,000. And this is somebody with a family. Did somebody see this yesterday? Somebody who read yesterday's Daily Nation? There are many challenges that our people are going through. And when you see somebody in a hole or in a crisis, it is upon you now to ask yourself, what can I do better so that I do not find myself in a situation where somebody else uh, is? 
So borrowing is very important uh, if you are investing in somebody, something that is going to make money for you. But if you are not sure where you are going to take that money, you can uh, throw yourself into a, to a crisis and more so the family. Sometimes uh, the head of the family, the, the husband borrows without the knowledge of the wife or the wife borrows without the knowledge of the husband and then you are using the house and, household items as, as the collateral. Where do you not pay? Zote zinakuja zinabebwa. Nyumba inashwa wazi. Hata watoto wanashanga. What's happening to mom and dad? Eh? So it is important that when you borrow, please make sure that you know what you are doing with those uh, finances. There are some statistics about our borrowing. First, as a country, our public debt as of July was approximately 10.6 trillion Kenya shillings. This means that each Kenyan would need to pay about 200,000 to pay off our country's debt. Ambia Mwenzako, who can add 200,000? Most of the most of the 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 debt we have as a country is from foreigners. We have borrowed from IMF. We have borrowed from the World Bank. We have borrowed from Chinese. And we have said, if you borrow, then you become a, a slave. So we are a slave. We are a slave to the World Bank. We are a slave to, to IMF. We are a slave to Chinese. And that is why they are the ones, because they have a, for, for, for us to do anything, they need to approve. Eh? So when you borrow, you become a slave. And unfortunately, many African countries, many developing countries have now been colonized by the white man through uh, lending, through debt and grants. Eh? So if we want to come out of that, then we need to kill a moja ripe 200,000 to talk up. 200,000, whether you are not dead or, or a baby, we owe 200,000. And therefore, we, until we, we free ourselves from that debt as a country, we remain uh, colonized. According to the Kenya Bank Association, the total bank loan defaults uh, stood at 621 billion in 2023. That gives you an idea of the money that we have borrowed, we have not been able to repay. And therefore, there are many people who are struggling because their assets, their land is being auctioned, their houses are being auctioned by the bank because they are not able to repay this loan. The Hustler Fund, which lets to individuals and small businesses has more than 13 million borrowers in default of 7 billion. There are many people who borrowed through the Hustler Fund and, and they haven't been able to, uh, to repay. Of course, there's a bit of uh, political anger to this because people believe in Marietu. Um, according to the Metropole CRB, a total of 19 million Kenyans have been listed on the Credit Reference Bureau database, which is about 66% of the adult population in Kenya. So what does it mean to be listed? If you are listed on this database, that means you are a defaulter, your credibility, you, you are no longer credible, your integrity is thrown out of the window. If you need a government job, and even uh, nowadays some of the private companies, they ask for your status in CLB, so they'll ask you, they'll ask for your details and they'll check for themselves because it, this is something you can log in online and you check. What is the CLB status? If you have somebody's detail, you can be able to check their status. Um, so, you may miss some opportunities because of being a defaulter, because of being listed. So it is important that we check and make sure that we remain honest. We remain honest and try to do uh, to live within our means. We talked about giving generously. The resources we have, everything we have, the money, physical assets, the job. And mungu tuame to pay amburi. And therefore, we need to be equally generous to those we know and to those 
we don't know. After meeting our own needs, God wants us to share some of what we have been given with, with others. Sometimes we have a tendency of giving only those who are likely to give back to us. But we are told it is more fulfilling to give to a person who may never repay you. Somebody uh, who could be in a crisis and they do not have the means. They may not have the means to repay you whatever you are giving or even to give you back. And the word tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we should look for opportunities where we need to give. And as you give, especially for those, the, those who are less blessed, then God is likely to give you more so that you can continue with the ministry of giving. The other principle we talked about is trusting in God, not your finances. Remember the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and who live in it. So all of us and our resources, we belong to God. We are expected to use ourselves and the resources uh, to honor God. And to, so let us trust in God, not the resources that God has given us. Can we trust in the one who has given us, not trusting in the things that God has given us? So when our economic and financial status improves, we tend to think now that we have money, we don't need to bother so much uh, with, the, with God. We think now with the finances we can be able to achieve everything. However, true security only comes from, from God. There are many people with a lot of money, but they, are not, they don't have security. They do not have happiness. Uh, in fact, those people who, are, who, have, who have little and they are contented, they seem to, to live a better life. So our prayer is that God will help us to abide in him and to know that the true security comes from him. Possessions are temporary. You, in, you are in a job that pays very well. You are in a business that does very well. Or generally, your life, you have been endowed with the resources. But a time comes when you lose everything. And more recently, we have been reading in the newspaper about people who have done very high-rise uh, high building, nice marionettes, and then one day you wake up, you find it a collapse last night. Assuming that is, that is all the wealth you had, you had put everything there. Natural disasters can come that can wipe away whatever you have. So let us not focus so much on the possessions because they are temporary, but tend to rely on God, who is the one who has who have given us those resources. We should not be anxious about the money problems. Money will never be enough. However much you have been, there are people with billions. Even people who are stealing public money, it's not because uh, they do not have enough. Money will never be enough. So let's not be anxious about the amount we have. By prayer and petition and thanksgiving, we just take our request to God. God knows our needs. He knows our wants. And he is going to supply to us according to our needs and according to uh, his plan for each one of us. So we must do our part, not to overspend, but save and invest money in what has eternal value. The rest, we leave it to, to God. That's why the word reminds us that godliness with contentment is great gain. Just be contented with what you have. Work, work hard. Keep on praying. Keep on working for the Lord. Be contented. At the right time, God is going to bless you with, 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 with even more. So we should, be, we should be content with what God is doing in our lives. So how do you honor God with your wealth, with your finances? We honor the Lord with our wealth by not allowing the accumulation of money to become the main ambition of our life. I'm sure in your mind you can look at some people whose main activity has been accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. Even on Sunday, they find it very hard 
not to close some businesses. There are some businesses that are not very critical. They, need, they are not essential services business. We know a place like a hospital, hospital needs to be open, but there are some other businesses that are not very critical. But they are, because somebody just wants to amass, amass, amass wealth, you are not able to create time to come and say thanks to the Lord. We use money not for selfish, materialistic purposes, but to prove that God is first in our lives. And honoring God with the finances means using the resources God has given you to bless others and advance his kingdom on earth. The resources we have used to bless others and advance the kind, his kingdom here on earth. So we honor God, as I said earlier, with our finances by tithing, faithfully and consistent. This is very important. Tithing faithfully and consistently. Faithfully is in terms of the amount, the 10%, we said, which is mandatory, which is a requirement, and then consistently. It's not one month, alafu unaruka zingine bili, consistent. And every time, every month, put it as part of your budget and you honor it. There are many churches here, we know, in this Nairobi, they do not have MMF like we do. Majority of our churches have MMF at the district level, MMF at the group level, and it's like you are being monitored whatever you are giving. But other churches here, they do not have MMF. They just rely on tithing and offering. And they have done uh, more things than maybe we have, we have achieved. As a parish, of course, we want to thank God because we have progressed. Remember, we used to have group MMF, this was the we used to have district MMF, this was the Now we are at the point where we want to tithe faithfully and consistently. Nobody is monitoring how much you are giving, but it is between you and your God. According to what you have been given, you just remain faithful. And then God in his own ways is going to remember uh, you. As, we con as I conclude, eh, as stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to us, each one of us has the responsibility to achieve financial freedom and glorify God. You can achieve financial freedom. Avoid unnecessary borrowing. The minute a person goes into debt, he loses a portion of his freedom. If you have a debt, and especially if you are struggling to repay, you start struggling in life, you do not have that financial freedom. And our prayer is that you remain uh, faithful, you remain disciplined, and spread within your means. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt of loving one another. The debt of loving one another. So, godliness with contentment is great gain. Just be contented with where you are, just be contented with what you have, just be contented with earning an honest living. Avoid corruption. Avoid shortcuts. Don't be in a hurry to make um, quick leashes. Let us be honest. Let us be content. Contented with the ritual that we have. Because our God is the one who owns everything. He is the one who has a good plan for us. And provided we remain faithful, he is going to open more doors for us. We continue uh, serving him and others and also advancing his kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you again uh, this afternoon with thanksgiving. We are grateful for the message that you have brought unto us. But Father, we need to be contented with what you have given us. We need to earn honestly. We need to give 10% to you because you are the owner of all that we have. We are just the managers. We are just the stewards of the resources you have put into our lives. And one day, Father, you'll want us to give an account of what we have done with our resources. Our prayer is, Father, that we will be found faithful because we'll have used the resources to serve others and advance your kingdom. 
We pray this believing and trusting in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you so much, our elder. We appreciate God for him and the knowledge and the wisdom that he has dispensed to us. Starting from last Sunday where we learned about our health. Sasa ni komifuko yetu. Stimeona reality on the ground. And I hope we will be doers of the word. Just start wherever you are. And God will bless you.